Good morning. My name is Amy Stengel and I am the Special Events Director for the Women's Leadership Initiative at the University of Delaware. I'm honored to invite you this morning to join us for this conversation. We have been so thrilled by the response from our community about this uh, series and we've been particularly thrilled for the leadership and sponsorship of some of our partner organizations. And so we'd like to thank the Delaware Business Times, WAWA, and the Delaware Prosperity Partnership for stepping up to sponsor this series. We also hope that you continue to engage with this webinar series. Um, we've had one, we have one more scheduled for next Friday, which we'll talk a bit about in a minute. And also with our previous webinars, which you can find recordings of on our Women's Leadership Initiative uh, website. We also would like to remind everybody that we are participating in the Zoom webinar format, which means that while uh, we can see your names and you can see panelists, all of our participants' audio and video are off for today. Um, but we do have an active chat and we absolutely encourage and invite you to participate in the chat, to share questions, comments, resources. Those of you who've been with us for previous webinars know that we've circulated after the webinar any of the resources that get shared in our chat. So please do participate. And just as a note, uh, remember that the default setting for our chat is just sending a note to the panelists. So please do pick all panelists and attendees so that everybody can see your comments or your questions. Also, if you like the music that you are listening to this morning, uh, we have a Rise Up playlist. You can find it on Spotify. So please go and check it out if you'd like to hear more of our very uh, motivational uh, music for, uh, for women. We also, um, before we move on to our program for today, um, wanted to stop for a moment to acknowledge that we are at a very critical juncture at this moment in our history. And uh, we know that there's a lot of pain and that there is a lot of um, suffering as a result of the re recent racial injustices that we've been observing. And so we also recognize that this is a particularly critical moment and that we want to be moving forward and taking action. And we realize that the price that we pay for these moments, for these opportunities are steep ones, and they come at the cost of the lives of people we've lost. So we'd like to take this moment to acknowledge all of the lives that have been lost in the name of racial injustice, but particularly Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and George Floyd. So we ask that you share with us in a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And as we, as a group at the Women's Leadership Initiative thought about how we might help create action around what has been happening and fight racism. We decided that one of the ways we could help do that is to add a webinar to our existing Leadership in Times of Crisis series. And so next Friday from 9 a.m. to 1030, we will be hosting another webinar entitled Addressing Racism, Advancing Justice in Times of Crisis. And any of you who participated in our past webinars will actually be automatically registered. Um, so you can please uh, feel free to join us if you can. Um, you will get a, a new email with a new link to join that webinar. So please be on the lookout for that if you are able to participate next week. We really hope it will be a conversation that will be both enlightening and a tremendous call to action. And so for today, in the midst of all that's been going on, we invite you to think about resilience. And when we first envisioned this series, it was really in response to the pandemic and, and we couldn't have imagined what would be happening uh, in our country with respect to all of the racial injustice that we've been seeing in recent events. Um, so we, we did envision this conversation as a conversation about resilience in the face of the pandemic, but we really do hope that some of the strategies we'll talk about today will be things that will translate in any difficulty and, and a moment of crisis. Um, and as I was thinking about the conversation today, um, I, I wondered if many of you may have seen something that's gone a bit viral on social media. There is a uh, conversation uh, around a poem written by a woman named Leslie Dwight. And before we get started, I'll read that to you. I think it's sort of a, a great starting point for today. It's called, What If 2020 Isn't Canceled? What if 2020 isn't canceled? What if 2020 is the year we've been waiting for? 
a year so uncomfortable, so painful, so scary, so raw, that it finally forces us to grow. A year that screams so loud, finally awakening us from our ignorant slumber. A year we finally accept the need for change, declare change, work for change, become the change. A year we finally band together instead of pushing each other farther apart. 2020 isn't canceled, but rather the most important year of them all. So to help us work through some of these um, thoughts and answers around resilience, I'm so thrilled to, uh, to acknowledge we have with us today two great experts on resilience, Dr. Mandy Ballou and Dr. Brianna Kaza. Dr. Mandy Ballou is the Associate Professor at the University of Delaware Lerner College of Business and Economics. Her research spans entrepreneurship, leadership, organizational behavior, cross-cultural management, and international development. Dr. Ballou publishes in premier journals, serves on the editorial review board for entrepreneurship theory and practice, and has presented at numerous international business and management conferences. Prior to receiving her graduate degrees, Dr. Ballou worked in marketing and advertising and engaged in extensive international travel in both developed and developing countries around the world. Welcome, Mandy. We also have with us Brianna Kaza, Associate Professor of Management at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro Bryan School of Business and Economics. Dr. Kaza received her PhD in Organizational Psychology from the University of Michigan. Her research program focuses on understanding all the resources and processes that produce resilience in turbulent and dynamic work contexts. Through her research, she seeks to identify ways individuals, dyads, and organizations can create work environments that allow professionals to thrive amidst unexpected events and environmental changes. She has a particular interest in identity and interpersonal dynamics related to the gig economy, multiple role holding, and marginalized work populations. Welcome, Brianna. So we'll begin this morning um, hearing from both Mandy and Brianna with a short overview of their work that will set the stage for our conversation and then we will open it up to your questions in a Q&A format. And so with that, I will turn over the conversation, Mandy. Good morning, Mandy. Good morning, Amy. What I thought we'd do today is sort of set the stage for and sort of set up what Brianna is going to talk about in a little bit. And I wanted to share with all of you my experiences with different women in developing countries, a little bit in the U.S. too, and maybe offer a bit of inspiration, um, some thoughts about how I see resilience and things that have been, have led to resilience for some of these amazing women. And I'm going to start with um, a definition. So uh, Brianna is going to share a definition too that's similar but different. But um, we both see resilience as an ability and it's something that grows after hardship or adversity as people continue to live a life of purpose. And resilience is what makes the positive outcomes during adversity possible in the first place. So with that, I wanted to ask all of you, uh, and you can put this in the chat, think about the last three months or so since this pandemic started. Um, what have you learned and are proudest of over the past three months? And if you're interested, stick those comments in the chat and we will let folks sort of have a bit of a conversation and apply resilience to your world and your life right now and basically through, you know, early 2020. So I want to show you some examples of different women that I have worked with. This is an example of a couple of women who, you know, it, girls going to school is a challenge in a lot of, uh, around the world, in many parts of the world. And in particular, when women or young or girls, teenage girls, um, adolescent girls, menstruate, they don't go to school because they don't have the uh, resources to be able to manage their day outside of the home. And so they miss a lot of school that their male counterparts don't. And so I did not know that this was something until I learned it from these women. But this is an example of a couple of women who have started massive workshops in different villages in their countries teaching girls how to make reusable sanitary napkins. 
Um, I had no idea there was such a thing until I learned this a couple of years ago from these women. And this is enabling girls to go to school and still handle their, you know, their personal lives at the same time. There's another example. This is Mary in Sierra Leone. In a bunch of the countries of, with women I've worked, girls face the, uh, mostly outlawed, but still a very long-standing cultural practice of female circumcision in the international development community. It's referred to as female genital mutilation. And this is one example of many young women who has represented her country in this case in a march and as a panelist for the Minister of Youth and to fight for stopping FGM. Another couple of examples. Look at the size of the people in this rally. And what I love about these images that these girls have shared with me, and these are a couple of different girls in a couple of different countries, women, the makeshift classroom that we're probably not terribly used to here in places like the United States, and the picture of hundreds of young women and girls not needing to rent an auditorium, not needing you know, special event space. They found a shaded area under trees and got a whole bunch of chairs and a couple of speakers and a table and they had an educational opportunity. The pictures on the bottom are giving women economic opportunities to farm for themselves and giving them access to land. I find it striking every time I see pictures like this of these women are barefoot they have their babies in their laps and they're literally tilling the soil and working the land. The contagion part of resilience I find really inspiring. These women are leading each other and inspiring each other and supporting each other as they move through the difficulties of their lives and come out stronger and become mentors and examples for other young women following them. My research has also taken me to Chicago and, and women in the United States. And I had done some interviews with some women um, in around 2014, and they weren't dealing with some of the same, you know, the same challenges that the women I just showed you were, but their response to the recession, these are female entrepreneurs owning businesses, and in several different instances, almost closed their doors because of the credit crunch and all the other things that were going on during the, the, the crisis. And when I asked the question, do you feel stronger? Do you feel more resilient as a result of the fear you just described and losing your business and laying off your employees? And the general response I got was, heck yeah, I feel much more prepared to weather the next storm after getting my business through this recession. I'm ready now. I got this. It won't be so terrifying. It'll be scary, but it won't be so bad. So this is uh, an example of a female entrepreneur in Afghanistan. And one of the other themes I see through these different women starting these civic engagement projects and their businesses is this need to find opportunities for other women and to lift other women up as they climb. And this particular quote came from one of the interviews. I have promised the women I will find jobs for you. As much as we develop our businesses, we have to find jobs for women who are victims of war. Here's another reality for some of the women um, in some research I've done. You hear, this is also in, a, in Afghanistan. You hear about the Taliban and all of that, but the reality is that women can work. It's just much more difficult than what you can imagine. We learn when to work and at what times, who to work with and where, and we continue. We can't wait for any kind of war to be over. They just do it. They move on and they do it, regardless of the dangers around them. This is a quote from a woman in France who is in an entrepreneurship program designed specifically for women who have been victims of domestic violence or some other type of violence. And the entrepreneurship program has helped them change their identity of themselves. So the general theme is I'm no longer a victim, I'm a business owner. And so this one woman says, I am doing entrepreneurship to live. My voice counts. I have things to say. I am able. Basically, I had a coup d'etat with myself. So I got into this work because as I met these different women, I found myself challenging my own concept of strength. And I found myself asking, gosh, what would I do if I was facing those challenges? And could I handle it the way they did? 
And the answer I came up with was, I don't know. They have been challenged in a way that I haven't. I've had my own opportunities to become resilient and challenges, but I haven't had those ones. And the resilience piece makes this so inspiring because these, when people have been put to the test, they have come out in a way stronger, more resilient than those who haven't. And with adversity grows resilience. So right before I turn it over to Brianne, I wanted to add uh, one more thought. You can put this in the chat or just think of it yourselves, to, you know, to yourself. Resilient people possess three different characteristics. One is a steadfast acceptance of reality, a belief that life is meaningful, and that's often buttressed with a real strong sense of values, and, a, and an uncanny ability to improvise. So I ask you, how are you with these three characteristics, and do you think you need practice I would argue, I do, we all do. Uh, how resilient are you when you're facing these things? And so with that, I will stop sharing and turn it over to Brie. Hi everyone, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I want to follow up with what Mandy said uh, and just actually talk a little bit more about the process of resilience in addition to um, all of the different ways that we can uh, think about resourcing ourselves to be more resilient when we're facing all of these different challenges that we are and many of which you guys have been putting in the chat and I've been reading as we go along. So when we think about resilience, um, resilience is a process by which people learn to positively adapt to a disturbance that's threatening its functioning, viability, or development in some way. So a couple of key components of this is that there's some potentially threatening event uh, and there's positive adaption. So there's disturbance and positive adaption. When we're thinking about resilience, I just wanna highlight three components that are really important to how I think about resilience um, and how I hope that you also think about resilience because I think they're key to allowing you to build your capacity for resilience over time. So the first one is that it's dynamic. So it's, it, you know, in the examples that, that Mandy gave, um, you could see that it's not just about one individual's tendency towards something. It also has to do with the community. It has to do uh, with the situation. So it is this interaction between the context, the situation, and the person, and all of the different aspects that are surrounding that um, in terms of the relationships they have, the organization they're embedded in, the community that they're in, and so on. The second component that's really important when we're thinking about resilience is that it's not a trait. Um, it is something that we can build over time. Individuals might have a tendency towards resilience, uh, and that is often called personality or trait resilience, but that's not the type of resilience we're talking about here. When we're talking about resilience in this context, we're talking about the act of positively adapting to a disturbance. Um, it's not something that everybody is born with, but it's definitely something everybody can develop. So the key question then is, how do you actually develop this resilience muscle? How do you emerge from these potential, potentially traumatic events, um, maybe all of 2020, with this idea that you have grown, that um, in the example that Mandy gave uh, with the entrepreneurs, that they are ready after emerging from a recession um, to meet the next challenge, that they feel like they have grown and that they're stronger as a result. So generally research on resilience, uh, and there's a lot of research on resilience in children, a little bit of research on resilience in adults. Um, but taking all of that together, we know that there's three basic ways that we can try to boost people's resilience. The first one are risk-focused strategies. Those are the idea that you will try to prevent or reduce individuals from feeling risk at work. Um, this sounds like a really nice idea, but it's very difficult. So we do want to have uh, our lives and our organizations to be places where we can try to prevent the most salient of risks, but that's not going to be a reality for all types of risks. So I suggest that we focus on two other types. Um, the second one would be resource focused strategies. Resource focused strategies are the idea that we can help people boost their resilience if we can increase their access to resources or the amount of resources in the environment. 
And finally, there's process focus strategies. And these are things that help you to either build your resources or utilize those resources when they're there. So it's about practicing and promoting the practices that allow you to take advantage of the resources that might be in your environment, or maybe even to make yourself more resourceful so you're generating those resources. So when I say resources, what I basically mean are what are the things that we know that have been associated with resilient functioning in, in uh, both children and adults. And if you look across this really big body of research, what you find is that there are there's some commonalities. There's some, some um, individual attributes, there's some relational attributes, and there's some social attributes that are usually associated with people doing quite well in these adverse circumstances. So a couple of these protective factors that are really clear to us are that people who tend to demonstrate resilience have higher problem solving skills. They have higher self regulation skills. They tend to have a motivation to succeed. They have a long term motivation. Um, they have a sense of self efficacy. So this belief in themselves that they can and uh, that they are able to do things. Um, and specifically, some people think it's a self-efficacy around being able to do hard things. Uh, an internal locus of control, so feeling like you do have influence over what's happening to you. Having psychological tendencies towards hope, faith, and optimism are all associated with resilience. And then some relational and organizational aspects, we know that having high quality social relationships, whether these are uh, spouse relationships, friend relationships, um, even strong relationships with your children or your parents, all of these are places or, or are things that become resources for individuals when they're going through hard times. And then finally, we see that people who are resilient tend to be embedded in well-functioning organizations and communities. So what I mean by that, it's not necessarily even the organizations and communities that have the most financial resources or um, you know, the most access to even financial resources. But what they do have are some of these other psychological or relational capabilities that makes them a strong unit. So again, reflecting on Mandy's example, um, you know, in many of those circumstances, the women did not have access to resources, but they were able to, as a community, become more resourceful um, because they had close relationships um, and they were willing to work together to achieve that. So I want to um, end my time by talking about three ways that I think that you can really build your resilience, thinking about process-focused strategies to increase resourcefulness. So the first one would be to normalize struggle and embrace ambivalence. So following through all three of these is this thread that I believe we have the power to make ourselves more resilient through our stories. Um, and so this idea that you can normalize struggle and embrace ambivalence follows from this because um, when we are thinking about what's happening to us, what we're going through, uh, we are narrating to ourselves our lives, our identity stories. Um, and if we can normalize struggle within those narratives um, and embrace the fact that there might be great things going on, but there's also negative things going on, so kind of embrace the complexity we're going to be better able to narrate ourselves a path to growth. So we need to accept that things are going to be hard um, and that struggle is normal, that everybody feels struggle. So the second aspect is to take control of your story. So I mentioned that one of the key resources for resilience is this idea of having an internal locus of control. When we feel like everything is happening to us, as opposed to when we feel like we are influencing our environment, we're less likely to be able to narrate ourselves into resilient patterns. So you have to really take control of the fact that you can change things in your environment, even if they're very small, in ways that will promote your growth. And finally, a big resilient strategy to get you access to more resources is to invest in your relationships. And this is actually quite complicated in a time like um, living in a pandemic, because a lot of the things that we're going through makes us act defensively. It might make us act in ways that undermine our relationships, but this is actually the time that we should really be trying to focus on investing in our relationships, whether this means taking a moment to be more compassionate towards the, you know, our 
coworkers, our friends, our family, um, because it's those relationships that we need to draw from when we're having a hard time to help us to become more resilient. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, um, but I just wanted to, to end by saying the three ways that you can really be resilient in this moment is to normalize the struggle, acknowledge it, and embrace the ambivalence in all of our moments, that intersection of good and bad. Try to take control of your story, so identify the ways that you can re-narrate things where you have control. One way um, that, uh, that, that you can think about doing this is instead of telling a story about an adversity where the coronavirus is the major um, kind of star of the show, Think about what your life will look like when you're past this. How did you get through this pandemic? Maybe working from home and having children that you're schooling from home or so on. What is it that you did? What were the practices? What will that look like on the other side? So have a more future or long range view. Um, and then finally, make sure that you're investing in your relationships, even when it feels really hard to do so and you feel depleted yourself. Wonderful, Brianna. Thank you so much to you and Mandy for sharing some of your insights based on research that you've done and sort of the extensive conversations you've had around resilience. And uh, Mandy, I wanted to start with you and you prompted the pa uh, participants to put into the chat any of their own thoughts about ways they've maybe been resilient over the last you know, number of months and what they may have learned. And um, just getting a chance to sort of look through, we've had some amazing responses here and people are talking about, you know, um, learning new skills, giving themselves more grace, um, appreciating the smaller things. And so um, there's one in particular that caught a lot of people's attention. Um, and Melissa Book talks about uh, improvising, I think, as you were mentioning, Mandy. And she talks about how she's had to do health checks for her, her firm when people come in the door. And each day she's come up with a theme and you know, sort of given people something to, to maybe smile or laugh about as they're addressing this, you know, very serious issue. So, you know, given some of the comments that have come through the chat and sort of what you've seen in the women that you've done work with, um, what are your thoughts about some of the strategies that people already seem to be implementing based on what we're seeing in the chat? Good question, Amy. So <laughs> I see, first of all, I see a lot of pride uh, and well-deserved pride in these comments. And I see women or, or men, if we've got them also joining us here, who've commented, rolling with it, right? Mm -hmm. These challenges are there whether you want them or not, and life has to keep going, and you all are doing that. It's not how you intended it, probably, and it's, you know, challenging you in a lot of ways, but as you roll with it, you grow, you look back, hey, well, I'm really proud of this and that, and at the time, maybe... Pride wasn't exactly what you were feeling, but you're feeling it now. And those examples are what the people in our webinar here are showing to other people. And so as people lift each other up, we can grow together. So, you know, there's this contagion. I, I like that word when it, well, maybe not during a pandemic, but there's a positive type of contagion where people, lift each other up and when we see examples of other people believing in themselves and taking a challenge and grabbing it and tackling it and coming out stronger on the other side and so forth that helps us see that in ourselves so that's what i see in some of these comments it's what i see with the people you know that i showed examples of earlier Brianna, um, I wanted to also then ask you as a re reaction to what has been kind of happening in the chat. You know, you talked about uh, building community and how important community is. And I think one of the things we've really focused on through this webinar series is trying to bring people together in community uh, to the extent that that's possible over, you know, a Zoom webinar. Um, but do you have any sort of good examples that you've seen, especially in difficult times of how people might have um, worked to build community and what that looks like? I think that's a great question. I think one thing that's unique about this global pandemic is to some extent we are all facing the same stressor, which is unique in many cases of resilience. Usually, um, you know, a stressor might be affecting some subgroup or an individual. Uh, and so I think in this particular moment, we can all embrace that we are 
in some ways, not to be cliche, all in this together, right? Um, and I do think that that helps, that we are all feeling, um, you know, we are all going through similar things. What I have seen in terms of how people have come together is I've seen um, people use virtual resources to build community. So Facebook groups that might be focused on, um, you know, sharing positive news or Facebook groups that might be focused on not even sharing positive news, but just being a place where people can share what they're going through and get feedback and get help. Um, so I think that the more we can connect on these virtual um, platforms, the better we'll feel. I have also seen people make sure that they maintain some of their routines in terms of uh, fostering their connections or cultivating their connections um, by having, you know, Zoom happy hours, for example, or just Zoom check-ins with people. Um, we also are seeing a strengthening sometimes of our generational ties because I, you know, there's been a lot of talk of how grandparents are actually stepping in and helping a little bit, you know, through virtual platforms with the homeschooling duties that some parents are having. And I think this is a great opportunity. Personally, my, my mother has been doing a lot of um, lessons with my children at times. And I can tell you that hour is not only great for them in terms of strengthening their connection, but I feel so grateful for her. Um, and so I think that all of those things are allowing us to actually strengthen our bonds, even though um, you know, we're, we're facing this tremendous stressor. I think the one thing we need to make sure that we're not doing is not giving people the benefit of the doubt. So I think it's easy when we're feeling stressed and we're feeling depleted, for example, to um, get frustrated with a coworker who might not turn something into us on time. Uh, but we're actually not sure what their situation is within this pandemic. We're all in this together, but it's manifesting very differently depending on what our caregiving responsibilities are, depending on what our work demands are, depending on how we're sleeping, how, this, how we're being affected, depending on our health. So we really need to take a moment and be compassionate towards the situation that people might be in. Terrific, great advice, Brianna. Thank you. Um, I think about you know also this concept of community. And so, Mandy, you know, you shared some slides where you've got pictures of women who've banded together in you know underdeveloped countries who are facing um, you know different adver adversity, you know, somewhat unlike what we've seen here through the pandemic. Um, but they really are banding together. And, you know, I think about Brene Brown has done a lot of research and has a book titled Daring Greatly, and really sort of the, taking the step to be bold and to, to face that um, potential adversity, um, because it's out of that adversity that you see growth, right? But, but it takes courage. And I wanted you to just maybe share a little bit of your perspective on working with these entrepreneurs and women in these um, very difficult situations. What have you seen in them in terms of courage and how that might relate to resilience? It's funny. I, no, I have not statistically analyzed courage with resilience, but the, most of these women, first of all, do not see themselves as these powerful individuals the way I do. And I have to constantly say, you are my inspiration. It's not the other way around. Or maybe it is, right? We, and they will probably tell you they're terrified. A lot of people going through these things are terrified. They're overwhelmed. They're completely stressed out. And, you know, that question, I don't know how you do it. Well, they're just doing it. You know, it's there. They're doing it anyway, and they're finding ways to do it. Now, not everybody handles things so positively, which is why the inspiration from other people in the community is so important. Um, the community might be different in different countries. So, uh, in you know, I've done research in women's entrepreneurship in Afghanistan, for example, and they will say, "Hey, you know, like the family can be the biggest barrier to letting me go start the business and learn English and so forth," but once I've got that, once I have the support of, you know, my father, my brother, my aunt, my mom, you know, so forth, I can conquer the world, right? And with their support, I have what I need behind me and I've overcome the biggest obstacle and I have help. And so that group might be different. So we ask the same question of women entrepreneurs in the United States. It's a similar response, but the group is different. It's not just the family and the large, you know, um, way that family is conceptualized, it's, you know, it might be 
my brother, it might be my best friend, you know, the family friend next door neighbor that we grew up with, the, the, the in-group is a bit bigger, but that support is there nonetheless. People will find it. And if, when you're resilient, they'll ignore the stuff that's in the way and find the ways to get support for what they're doing. And I see that as a common, regardless of courage or fear, right? Going through it, courage might be feeling like it's completely non-existent, right? The fear may be worse, but um, the courage is there, whether it feels like it or not, but it's probably negatively correlated to resilience and resilience grows from all of that, all those challenges. That's great. And, and as you know, you sort of ended there with a the thought about resilience growing and wanted to tie that back to a comment that Brianna made about sort of normalizing struggle. And it makes me think anybody who's read work by um, Glennon Doyle, you know, she's talked a lot about how she overcame some of her own demons earlier in her life, um, but really learned to sit with grief and pain and sort of let it happen instead of trying to numb yourself to grief or to pain. And so I wanted to maybe ask you, Brianna, to talk a little bit about when you, when you think of normalizing struggle, um, we still want to honor it, right? We still, we still want to know that it's there. We're not talk, talking about shutting it down, but sort of talk a little bit about, you know, what that means in more detail to you. Sure. So when, I, when I'm talking about normalizing struggle, um, I think what I mean is making it okay to acknowledge the fact that things can suck <laughs> and that you can get through them. And actually thinking about that and, and holding that, the fact that you can be in a hard place, can actually allow you to generate meaning and to find your path forward if it's in combination with perhaps some idea of hope or you think that you can get there in the future. So let me break that down a little bit more. There was this really interesting study that was done on um, grade school children. And basically what they did is they uh, provided people with two different narratives. One narrative was of Albert Einstein and all of his great successes, all of the things he achieved. The other narrative that they provided a different group of students was one about his struggles. Um, and so they were able to see you know, Albert Einstein went through all of these hardships, went through all of these issues. Um, and what they found was the group that was exposed to the struggle narrative were the ones who were actually able to um, do better on math questions. They persisted longer. So they had more resilient like behavior and they had more resilient like outcomes. And so what I think that means is that sometimes if we focus on just the positive, if we only hear the positive stories, if we see that our coworker is turning everything in all the time and we're focusing on making self comparisons to that person and then starting to feel bad about ourselves, we're actually losing our ability to find our own growth in the moment. Um, on the other hand, if we acknowledge that this moment is hard for everybody, it might be especially hard for you because that's the headspace you're in. But um, even though it's hard, this struggle is normal. It's, it's okay to feel like you're not coping one day um, and you need to be gentle with yourself. Developing that kind of self-compassion, acknowledging the hard stuff will help you to get through um, those difficult moments. And so I do think that it's really important to normalize struggle. Um, and I think it's really important for leaders and for parents to normalize struggle so that they're modeling to their children and to their workers um, that in order to get through hard moments, you have to acknowledge that they're there and that everybody struggles. Um, and that helps us to, to build this narrative of resilience. You know, when I went back to the definition, there is disturbance in order to catalyze resilience, to catalyze that growth. Um, and so we have to have, we have to acknowledge that first component in order to get to the second. Absolutely. And it's, you know, I think there's been a lot of conversation about empathy, you know, and it's sort of the first time maybe ever that you're hearing the concept of empathy being talked about in, in work settings, you know, that people are recognizing that, um, like you said earlier, that everybody's dealing with a different situation at home because that's where we are right now, um, that's going to impact how we show up. And it might not be because we intend to show up that way, but it's because that's what our circumstances dictate. So, you know, I love that you're talking about, you know, acknowledging that, and I think it's acknowledging it for yourself and acknowledging it for other people as well, your coworkers or your peers. Um, 
that are also struggling as well. Um, so I wanted to shift gears a little bit. Um, there's a question in the chat. Mandy, obviously you've done a lot of work with women in um, underdeveloped countries. And uh, one of the questions is, you know, is there a difference in the resilience factors of men and women? Do you see that um, in any of the work that you've done, you've, you have any evidence of how women uh, rate compared to men? It's funny. I. I will, I will tell you a story about some research we did have, and it came out of the, the same study with the Afghan, same data from the Afghan research. And we asked people about their, their perception of danger. Um, resilience, we, could, we couldn't statistically show that resilience was stronger for one gender or the other. But what I found really, really interesting, we published an article on it, that women perceive danger very differently than men do and women perceive less danger so and women entrepreneurs who are out in the workforce perceive the least so it should tells me we didn't have the data for the resilience effect the women so the men seem to see a lot more danger women are like yeah you know the taliban's there it's not going to stop me i'm going <laughs> we got to live our lives we got to create opportunities for the women we have to provide for our families we have to grow our businesses and they just they're not oblivious <laughs> they are aware the dangers and the perception of danger that they have may be different it's not really related to war and insecurity and bribery and kidnapping and things outside the home it's at home you know, there's things that women have to face that men just don't. And the findings that in that particular analysis that the women entrepreneurs perceive the least, the female non-entrepreneur women then, then male non-entrepreneurs and male entrepreneurs see the most. So I just found that really interesting that they seem to ignore it. And we were asking questions about you know, in society, not at home. And so those particular, that view, that context, they were just like, yeah, get out of my way. You know, I, I, I have other obstacles. I'm getting over them. I'm going to ignore it. I got to live my life. And it was really inspiring that this group that I think a lot of people look at as, um, you know, beaten down and unable are really the opposite of that their their strength and their tenacity and their the resilience they have grown through all of the challenges they live through is to me incredible absolutely fascinating work and i don't know brianna if you've seen anything in the work that you've done that you know speaks to the same issue you know male versus female in terms of resilience I think that's a really interesting idea. I have uh, my dissertation work with our midwives, which were all um, mostly women. <laughs> and I've also studied women in STEM. We are launching a study that is actually going to be looking at a large um, engineer, engineering firm, and we're trying to gender balance the sample so we can better understand the, um, the more micro level resources that might affect their resilience on a day to day basis. So we're actually looking at you know, trying to predict daily depletion um, and how that affects it. But I don't, you know, we're just launching the study. I don't know. But I can tell you that we're theorizing something similar to what Mandy was describing, which is that there might be differences in how people are able to become resilient, gender differences. We might have these different predispositions. We might be socialized in different ways. But I don't know that there will necessarily be differences in the end state resilience, right? So if we think about, I think that there's probably around, you know, an equal number of men and women who might become resilient at the end of the day, but the way that they do that might look very different. Um, but I think it's a really important thing for us to learn about because, um, you know, it might mean that we need to change our workplaces um, or be aware that men and women might need access to different types of resources in order to become more resilient. Um, and so we might need to think about what those strategies look like. Yeah, that's great. You know, and I, sort of just the first thing that pops to my mind is we, we know, generally speaking, women, women tend to be maybe more collaborative than men. And sort mm -hmm. of to this point of community being a really important aspect of resilience and knowing that you have people that you can reach out to, you know, maybe there's something inherent in the fact that women 
may be more inclined to kind of reach out and collaborate and sort of talk to their peer group and look for those resources and help to lift each other up. So it'd be really fascinating to see what you find when your study is concluded. Yeah, I do also want to, to say one thing, which is that I do think that sometimes women are more burdened with having to tell a resilient story um, than men are. And I think that that could have two implications. One is that we have a stronger, you know, more cultural narrative for resilience. We're expecting hard stuff more often, especially in the workplace. Um, but some research done um, by some other colleagues suggests that that can actually wear on us over time. Um, so if we are in one of those groups, either being a gender minority or a racial minority, the burden of having to tell a resilient story or being expected to be resilient um, can actually weigh us down. Absolutely, I think we're probably hearing a little bit about that right now in the conversation that's happening around racial injustice, right? So. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, I do also want to shift gears a little bit again, uh, knowing our time is, is going quickly. So let's think about, you know, there's a lot of conversation around what the new normal will be. We've, we've all sort of been working through this very unique time. And at some point, um, we will go back to some level of, of work and what the new normal might be. Um, so as, you've, as you draw on your expertise and experiences in studying resilience, um, Maybe I'll start with you, Mandy. Are there some specific techniques or things that you can share that are useful for people as they start to tackle the new normal? Uh, yeah, uh, I have a couple. So I would say when you're in despair, worried, overwhelmed, stressed, scared, etc., cetera, uh, remember the other people that inspire you and draw motivation from them. Um, some of this hits to the things that Brianna was saying earlier from the research, right? And, you know, b you can believe in your ability and draw inspiration from other people. And remember that whether you see yourself this way or not, you are an inspiration to other people. You know, I, I, I have this back and forth with my African women that I've built, you know, relationships every summer. We have an ongoing WhatsApp group that they post in daily. It's amazing. Thing. We have so I have this ongoing relationship and I'll have these one-offs and repeatedly you know oh you know you're a working mom and you have this great career and you're such an inspiration to me and I'm thinking how am I an inspiration to you <laughs> you're incredible you know you've been selected for this program represent your country and I you know and so we go back and forth no you're more inspiration no you're more of an inspiration but that is inspiring you know there that I make that sort of an impact on somebody because they have definitely made it to me. So I would say look for those um, stories, those people, you know, it may be somebody you know, it might be something you read in the, in the news, you know. And uh, this also hits to some of the things that Brianna had shown from the research, do your best to accept the reality of the situation. Uh, stay positive, that's hard to do, and uh, cut yourself some slack when you're just not feeling very positive at that time, right? And, and you'll get through it, try to stay positive. Focus on improvising and improving as you go and just do your best. I mean, in the end, that's all we really can do is your best and it is enough. And the outcomes you get may not be what you planned, but they're going to be fine. You did what you could and that's, you know, that's the best we can do. And we have to take pride in that, you know, it's um, and realize that the way you see yourself, if you're giving yourself a hard time or you're just in those overwhelmed stress moments, probably isn't the way other people are seeing you. And there's, I think, um, inspiration for ourselves when we realize that other people find inspiration in us and our stories without us having to do much for others, you know, just doing it and having people see it is inspiring and helps build resilience within and externally. Okay. So Brianna, I know you talked about and you went through kind of the application of resilience in sort of the different factors. Um, and you also shared the story about how it's been wonderful to have your mother more involved, um, you know, in, in, with your children through this period of time. As you think about the same thing, uh, you know, sort of what are some of the practical applications or stories from your own experience that people could take away as they're trying to be resilient? Sure. So one thing that I think that we can do is to draw on our own resources of 
uh, I mean, our own stories of resilience from our past. So thinking about ways that we have been resilient before can help us in the same way that Mandy talked about finding role models and trying to emulate them. I think that we can think about our own stories, reach back into our past, into our history, and think about times that we've been through hard times um, and come out the other side. And retelling those stories to ourselves will help us to see ourselves in more resilient ways in this moment. Um, but also just, I, I don't wanna um, keep reemphasizing the same point, but I think we need to be gentle with ourselves in the moments where we feel like we're not coping. Um, and then we also need to recognize that we can be quite resourceful in those moments as well. So a couple of practices that I use when I'm feeling really kind of at the end of my rope, um, I have a file on my computer that I call, you know, good day files or bad day files. And um, they're just mainly things that I have received that make me reflect on times that I've done well, <laughs> that I have been successful. So it might be emails from somebody. Um, it might be, you know, a letter that I've received. It might even just be a picture of a moment where I was like, I, I did actually do this. Um, and I do think tapping into those by actually reviewing them helps me to feel more resilient. Um, and second, I think that it's really important to foster our connections. Um, so if you are feeling down, that's the time where you need to write your friend and find out if you can have a Zoom um, kind of check-in moment or go for a walk with somebody. Um, even if that somebody ends up being your dog, I think that you will start to feel a sense of connection and that relational connection does help us to move forward. Great. And, you know, I think um, that's actually sort of an interesting note for us to add that one of the conversations we've been having through the Women's Leadership Initiative with the experience of running each of these webinars and, and sort of the responses, especially, you know, comments we're seeing in the chat is, you know, how can we help facilitate that community for all of these participants and extend it and sort of offer another, um, you know, option for connection. So I, I will ask everyone to sort of stay tuned because we are working on some things for the summer where we hope to help continue to bring this community together for these touch points and to talk about some of these, you know, sort of meaningful issues that we're still going to clearly be grappling with for some time to come. So I will say, uh, we'll put a pin in that and say, stay tuned. I think there'll be more coming very shortly. Some additional resources for this leadership in times of crisis uh, community. Uh, I had one more question, Mandy, or, or maybe more comment that I wanted to, um, to put to you, which is, I love that one of the quotes you shared was that one of the women described herself as having had a coup d'etat with herself. It was almost sort of having to, uh, I guess, you know, rethink who she was and, and sort of what she stands for. Would you just talk a little bit more about what what she might have been referring to? Because I love that concept and it seems very, um, you know, resonant right now. Yeah, that is, comes from research with uh, women who have, who are now in a business development training program to start their own businesses and become entrepreneurs. And they came into this program because they are victims of some sort of um, domestic violence, uh, prostitution, trafficking, something um, like that. And that research was looking at this shift in identity from and we're looking at something called shattered assumptions theory. So this idea that the world has been somewhat shattered in their view of themselves and their place in it. And where we're finding through this entrepreneurship program, as they're changing their identity at, from victim to business owner, income earner, um, you know, job creator, they're reimagining themselves and going through a process of that's where the coup d'etat came from, you know, this sort of internal revolution of I'm not going to be that anymore, I'm going to be this. And that's a lot more fun <laughs> and it's more empowering. And I'm not going to go back to doing that. I have gotten through that. I'm stronger now. And so now I'm going to do this instead. And when I face other challenges going forward, I'll face them, right? But they're going to be different and I'm going to face them as a different person than I was before. It's sort of a shift in identity. Um, the argument in that particular research is that we're showing the power of entrepreneurship training and changing one's identity from something like a victim to a business owner. Um, super, you know, it, fun research. Again, I keep using this word inspiring, maybe I'm overusing it, but it's inspiring to me, right? To, to hear people reimagine themselves, re, 
create themselves in something different. I think that's exactly it. The, the stories are so incredibly powerful. And, and I think a little bit about people I've spoken with who've maybe um, been laid off from a job and then often will reflect back and say it was actually the best thing that ever happened to them because they did reinvent themselves. And it caused them to stop and reflect and say, wait a second, that's not who I want to be anymore. I want to, I want to be this person. Um, and they were sort of forced into doing that, making that, that um, decision. But uh, it's really, I think, those stories of people who face these things and reinvented themselves and gone on to do bigger and better things that can be incredibly inspiring. So I love so that I think to, uh, to build on that, I think that is sort of a difference between resilience and courage, right? In those moments where you're sort of thrust into these things, courage is probably not the word you would pull. Um, courage is tackling something that you choose to tackle. You know, it's, it's a goal that is set that you are choosing to go after. Um, we don't usually choose adversity. We don't usually choose violence or getting, losing a job or all those things. And the resilience grows from just, I'm in it, I'm dealing with it, and I'm moving on, and I'm going to make things better. And you're right, you do hear that fairly common. When I look back, it was horrible at the time, but now things are so much better, you know, and they're better than I would have thought they would have been. And so, I, you know, I did it, you know, yeah. Exactly. Well, um, we've come very quickly to the close of our time. Um, Brianna, before we sign off, anything, any last thoughts you wanted to share with the group? I guess one thing that uh, what Mandy was saying reminded me of is the importance of um, being flexible and adaptable in, in order to become resilient. And so I think the more that we can think of ourselves in broader ways, our capabilities in broader ways, that we can retool, you know, our skill sets as being more universal, that we can transport it from one situation to the next if we were to, for example, lose a job or need to, um, to change what we're doing, uh, the better off we are. So, you know, being able to think about ourselves in really flexible ways is so, so critical. Great. That's a perfect note to end on. So I want to thank Mandy and Brianna for your time this morning and sharing all of your expertise and the stories from your research. And hopefully our participants are uh, leaving on this Friday morning with a few other ideas to take back to their work lives and their home lives as we continue to try to you know, for, find our way through this crazy time. Um, I did want to just also note that um, as I mentioned, the Women's Leadership Initiative is looking to extend this community into the summer and we'll be back to you soon and we welcome your thoughts around that if you have ideas that you'd like to share. Um, and also, um, some of you may know that Learner College has an executive mentoring program and we are at this moment actually looking for executive mentors for that program. And so we invite you, um, if you're able or interested, to reach out to Libby Cusack. Uh, her email address is L. C-U-S-A-C-K at udel.edu. We will include that in our follow-up email later today. So if you didn't get that and you want to participate, not to worry, um, just look for the email later today. Um, so on that note, thank you for your time this morning. And again, if you can join us next Friday for our, con our conversation on addressing racism, uh, we welcome you to join us for that and uh, have a wonderful Friday. Thank you so much. Bye everybody. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you.